with Cool Jazz Cafe. We're at the 27th annual Boss Cogsworth's Jazz Fest in Reading, Pennsylvania in the beautiful amphitheater here at the Doubletree by Hilton, catching up with fabulous saxophone player Everett Harp. Thank you for being here. Dan, thanks for having me. And what a great voice you have, too. Oh, thank you. And a great <laughs> voice that you give to the saxophone. <laughs> you really do. Thank you so much. Um, like um, I've told many other people, you know, it's what we strive for as musicians to create our own voice, the mm -hmm. uniqueness and style and voice is what we, you know, look for. Even though when we were coming up, we always um, identified people we wanted to sound like. And you learn their traits and, and different people. In my case, there were um, more than a handful of people that I listened to and wanted to emulate. And eventually they, they all became you know, mm -hmm. part of my sound. Right, right. Well, you know, when you are on stage, you have such a wonderful presence as mm, well. Thank you. You really, really do. Wow. And the show that you're doing here at Burke's Jazz Fest that I know you're going to continue to do more of mm. is really remembering George Duke. Right. And George Duke has really touched a lot of our lives. Yeah, he has. Yeah. I was sitting in a, in a restaurant earlier and a couple came up to me and and they were talking about, talking about that aspect that they had never really, uh, weren't really familiar with George Duke. And um, they, they basically, this was quite some time ago, they had seen Al Jarreau and George Duke. It was mm, like maybe 2004. Yes. And they weren't really that familiar with George, but they were Al Jarreau lovers. And mm -hmm. there was someone else they mentioned that was in the, in the group. I think it was, um, it was a female singer. Right. And um, <coughs> we, um, we started talking and they, and they basically said, man, we fell in love with that guy. What a mm. great spirit, what a great soul, and what a fantastic player. Mm -hmm. And then he went home and looked on their records, and he said he was on everything we had. Wow. You know, so mm -hmm. George, George really touched a lot of our lives, um, n none more so than myself. I had a, a relationship with him since 1988, and, um, and he signed me to my record deal after we met, and he hired me to play with Anita Baker. Um, he, he signed me to my record deal, and we were intertwined ever since. Mm. Amazing, isn't it? The influence and impact that mm. someone can have on your life. Sure. And I think when you and I were doing a podcast, you were telling me how his influence as a band leader mm. has influenced you as sure. well. Sure. I think George's uh, personality. What what came natural for George is George wound up having to be a learned trait for me. George had a personality where he basically it was effortless for him to make people feel at ease. And he also knew that he, by doing so, he'd get the best out of them. Mm -hmm. And generally that's in the studio. And he would constantly be this guy. I mean, it never really changed in all the years I knew him. It would never, I've only seen him change from that, get really frustrated maybe a handful of times mm -hmm. in 30 years. But um, he was always the same guy, always the guy that said, eh, I just don't, don't let it bother me. Just move on. Just I, I know what to do. And yeah. he always had the answer. Mm -hmm. And it, his, one of his remarks was, it is what it is, mm -hmm. move on. And I, I claim that as my mantra. It is what it is. There's not, there are some things you can do something about and some things you can't. Right. And I believe that was a, an ish, um, a distinct part of his makeup. And he had this ability to make everybody feel at ease at, ease, at home and, and, and just crack you up. He was a funny guy. Mm -hmm. And he was always laughing. And, uh, that's just something that was so natural for him. Um, and parts of it is a learned trait for me because I'm kind of a, um, I, I am a funny, I can be a funny guy. I can, I can tell jokes. But I, I, I'm kind of a loner at times. So I, I don't mind being at home alone uh, or with my wife, but when she's away, I, I don't mind, I don't have to have people around me all the time. I'm not saying that George did. But um, so when it comes to getting my personality out and interacting with people, sometimes I can be a bit more direct. So in working with George all those years, I learned to take on the mantra, you mm -hmm. know, come on, just lighten up. Yeah. Well, nothing's, nothing's that big of a deal. Nobody's dying today, mm -hmm. you know. So um, he, he was a great guy to learn, to learn how to work in the studio with. Mm -hmm. um, dealing with different personalities, because you, you know musicians, we have like the personalities are <laughs> you know certainly varied and and some intense and some not mm -hmm. um and george what i learned from george is you have to learn to call the people for certain projects 
that fit what you need to do. There are certain people you can direct, and there are certain people that you call to come in and do what you do what they do. Right. And those people you don't direct, you just turn on the tape and let them go. Mm -hmm. And the people that you can direct, you say, hey man, I need this here, I need this here, I need mm -hmm. this there. And those are the category of people that you do that with. But the pe <laughs> I made the mistake of trying to direct a person that you have to let them do what they do. Okay. And it turned into a, like a two or three hour long session that was really arduous. And, mm. and he pulled me aside and he said, that's one of those guys, you just let him do what he does. Yeah. And I said, okay, I learned. Yeah, wow. What a great history you've had with him. Mm. When you're on stage and you're performing, what are you feeling, Everett? You connect well Anxiety. with the audience. Um, hmm. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, it's transitioned over the years. I remember back when I was in the farming grounds in Houston playing in clubs four hours a night with a pop R&B uh, jazz band. And I would, um, it, it, was, it was something really innate. I mean, I've always loved performing. Mm, uh, I've always okay. loved playing. I've always played. Um, but actually being a performer was, I should say, I've always loved playing, but being a performer was something different. And when I started doing it, it took, I, I don't know that I immediately grasped the audience, um, but it, I think it, it came rather quickly and seamless to the point where people would eventually tell me, yeah, when you're playing, you're looking directly. I, I'd look people in their eyes mm. and I'd look right into it and they say, it's like you're looking in my soul. And then after I got married, I stopped doing that. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, because there was something uh, too intimate about that, mm. that once I got married, it didn't feel right. Um, and I found myself, um, I found myself changing my perspective in that way. And, and I still, I would not look directly at any one person for too long a period of time, but I'd still get out and engage with the audience, which is a lot of fun. So, yeah, it is. Um, look, I just enjoy, I do enjoy the interaction. Sometimes I become introspective on stage. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, I, I think for most guys that, that really love to play jazz, you have to go there sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, because if, if I'm standing and I'm performing all the time for you, then I'm not really, <clears throat> reaching for, I'm sorry, reaching for anything different than what I've done before sometimes. Okay. Sometimes it's just, in that regard, sometimes it might be just a performance. And there's nothing wrong with that because mm -hmm. there's, there's still an, uh, an integrity in that. Right. But most of the times when I play, I like to, um, I like to play for myself too. Okay. And, um, and in a lot of cases, I make the, I, I, while I still engage, the audience is a by, are bystanders. Mm. Because I'm, after so many years, I'm still reaching to try and impress me, which is a hard thing to do. Mm. And um, a lot of times I come off stage and I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm still working hard to do that. Yeah. Uh, because there are things that I hear that I've heard other people do, things that I, I hear in my head that I try to reach for to play. And they may not come out the way I wanted mm -hmm. to. So, uh, you know, as far as engaging with the audience, that, that did come naturally. There's an aspect of that that I, I like to have fun. And it's a different personality on stage than it is off stage for me. Yeah. Well, we like how you engage us. Thank you. And I can't wait to hear what you're doing here at Burke's Jazz Fest. It's going to be fun with uh, Shantae and Phil Perry and mm. Brian Simpson, Brian Bromberg, Rayford Griffin, and Dwight Sills. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful band. And the show is going to be... I believe it's going to be very real and raw in the, in the fact that I don't know that any one of us have had an opportunity to uh, pay a tribute to George in any uh, public faction yeah. uh, since he passed. And so I just tell people to, you know, bring them plastic because it's going to be on the front row because there's going to be waterworks, I yeah. think. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this. And, thank you. And, Thank you for being here with us today and My sharing pleasure. a little bit about who you are and what you're about. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here with you, Diane. Thank you, Everett. We are at Burke's Jazz. <laughs>